much for welcome. Uh, thank you very much for asking me to give this talk. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I just wanted to say, Jeff Bailey's on the front row here, my PhD supervisor. I haven't seen him for a while. And it reminds me that the very first presentation I gave, the very first conference presentation I gave, was in Newcastle when I was a second year PhD student in 1988 at TAG. I think it was a theoretical archaeology group. I think it was the first geoarchaeology session at TAG. So TAG was getting to grips with environment and geoarchaeology and those kind of things. And uh, I have very fond memories because Richard McPhail gave me a really hard time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and it was just before Christmas and I was trying to get home to Warrington. I didn't have any money, so I hitched home and I ended up in Gretna Green for five hours. So I'm hoping that uh, today's experience will be uh, a little different. But I'm delighted uh, to have this opportunity to share with you some of the work that we've been doing in the Nile, in the Nile Valley, in, in Sudan. Um, over the last 20 years or so, we first went to Sudan in 1995. Uh, rather a long title, uh, From Green Sahara to Desert River, I'm talking about environmental change uh, in, the, in the Middle Holocene, a geoarchaeological perspective on roughly 6,000 years of environmental change um, in the Sudanese Nile Valley. And at the end, I'll do a few comparisons between Sudan and Egypt and talk about why uh, the best records of fluvial change are actually in Sudan at the moment rather than in Egypt. We'll, we'll come on to that later. What I would like to acknowledge is a whole range of people that um, have worked in Sudan with me, primarily uh, Mark Macklin. Uh, we've done all the geomorphological work that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, the two projects we've been involved in, in collaboration with the British Museum, led by uh, Derek Wellsby and Neil Spencer. Uh, and Matt Dalt is Matt here. He's speaking later this, in, in this meeting about some of his work at Amara West. And various people have, have, have uh, contributed luminescence dates and, and various other um, collaborations. And I just want to point out, it's one of the privileges of my career of being able to work in Sudan with the people of Sudan and work in the Nile Valley. It's a truly wonderful place to work. So I want to acknowledge all the local help that we've had as well during the course of these um, researches. So, uh, a few questions. Uh, this is an aerial photo I took of uh, a stretch of the Nile in northern Sudan in 2008 when we were flying north from Khartoum to Dongola. Uh, and it illustrates very nicely uh, the sort of context that we're working in. You will have spotted already, there's a Palio channel there on the left-hand side. Let's, um, let's put some water in that. And this illustrates some of the, some of the questions about river-human-environment interactions that we've been grappling with. And I just want to put some questions on here now. For example, we've been thinking about Palio channel systems. We've got evidence for the Nile drying up systematically at certain periods of time, but we're asking why that happens. Is it related to internal or external controls? We also have evidence of the Nile having much greater discharges uh, in the past, uh, where we've got multiple channels in, in various reaches and much wider channels than we see at the present day. So one of the general questions um, we're thinking about is, um, let's go back here, sorry, is why do rivers change their form? And we've identified what we've called as channel network contractions. Okay, it's rather a mouthful. But we see evidence of decreases in the number of channels on the valley floor, and then we also see evidence of, of channel narrowing, where we have evidence of falling discharges, and abrupt shifts in discharge from one state to another. So these channel network contractions have profound impacts on the cultures uh, and the people living in the Nile Valley and the availability of resources and where they organize their activities. So more generally, uh, Mark Matlin and I are geomorphologists. We're physical geographers. We come at these uh, geoarchaeological projects very much from a geomorphological point of view. So I guess this is particularly opposite in this first session on geoarchaeology and landscapes. We're especially interested in why do rivers change their form. And some questions that we're interested in is can we see a climate signal, for example, in the fluvial archive, in the Nile or elsewhere? Some of these changes that we see in terms of these contractions, they could be explained with external controls, so there may be a climate shift where we have a decrease in rainfall or a decrease in monsoon intensity and we get a fall in discharge. Or we could just simply have a shift in the location of a channel, which we call an avulsion. So we have internal and external controls. And we have to try and disentangle those particular controls to understand what's happening in the system. So that can be quite a challenge. <coughs> but crucially, the archaeology and the distribution of archaeological sites can help us calibrate these uh, interpretations. So some other questions. How do big rivers respond to abrupt climate change? And what implications does that have for people living in uh, these river valleys? 
Where are the best records of change? Where can we see the most detailed records of fluvial environmental change and cultural change? Can we date them? How do we date them? And I also want to talk a little bit about how we might integrate the archaeological and the geoscience uh, data sets. And I'll illustrate that through a, a series of maps. And what can we learn from the now more generally? What are the wider implications for the geoarchaeology and the study of landscapes in, in other parts of the world? Okay, so my talk uh, is about the Green Sahara and the transition from the Green Sahara to the, the Arid Sahara that we're most familiar with today. This is a beautiful diagram put together just over a decade ago by Rudolf Krupp and Stefan Kropel. It was published in Science. And it shows very nicely the major environmental changes that actually you see across the whole of northern Africa. But this just focuses on the northeast corner. You've got Sudan at the bottom and Egypt in the top. End of the last whole stage, the Pleistocene, very, very dry and arid. Archaeological sites, late Paleolithic sites, clustered in the Nile Valley. In the early Holocene uh, wet period, what's known as the uh, African humid period, we get archaeological sites uh, spread throughout what is now uh, the <coughs> desert. And then over time, the, this area becomes drier, becomes more arid, and archaeological sites tend to be focused then on the Nile Valley, but with a few sites scattered out in the desert where you have uh, oases and water supplies. So we have the African humid period. And there's been some debate about whether the end of the African humid period was round about, depending where you look in the literature, five and a half thousand years ago, four and a half thousand years ago, was it a transitional event, was it a gradual change, or was it an abrupt environmental change? So we've got the African humid period and the desert Nile uh, either side of that. Now I'm going to focus on this part of uh, northern Sudan here, which shows it's got the rainfall here, Around about, at that time, around about 400 millimetres, 500 millimetres, which is similar to East Anglia. Um, but it becomes much drier slightly later. And I also notice that uh, uh, Cooper and Cropeland just got a single Neolithic site here. Now, we've got many more than that now uh, in northern Sudan. So this is the reach that we're looking at. This is just upstream of uh, Lake Nubia or Aswan. Um, I'm going to mainly focus on the northern Dongola reach survey. Data sets here uh, near the modern town of Dongola. And also talk about the Kerma civilization here. All these red dots here represent Kerma sites, which span about 2400 to 1450 BC, before this part of the Nile Valley was invaded by the Egyptians uh, during the New Kingdom. And there was also a major environmental change uh, at that junction as well. So this is the area. I'll talk about Dongla Reach. I'll also mention Amara West briefly, and I'll also mention this area near Tombos at the very end of my talk. Uh, so we talk about the Neolithic. Uh, I'll talk about the Kerma and then later periods and show what's happened to the river system and the landscapes uh, over what's roughly about 6,000 years. So, uh, in terms of the archaeological data, this is Derek Wellsby here, uh, who's probably the world expert on the archaeology of the Sudan. He's been working there uh, every winter for the past 25 years or so. In the mid-90s, they carried out a major survey of the northern Dongola Reach and mapped, systematically mapped all, all the archaeological sites on the valley floor. Prior to the survey, there was a single site at Kawa, which is a New Kingdom site, which is founded in the time of Tutankhamun. But this is a very, very rich archaeological landscape uh, with uh, buildings, uh, cemeteries, uh, wells, pottery scatters, pyramids, if you look closely. And during 94, 95, they did the northern part of the reach, and then in 95, 96, when we got involved, um, they surveyed the southern part of it, which is about 80 kilometers north-south. So it's a big chunk of the valley floor. The distance from the modern Nile here, the maximum distance to this bedrock plateau, is about 18 kilometers. So it's a big chunk of the Nile Valley. And it's an incredibly rich archeological landscape. So from a situation of having one site, we had about 450 plus sites. And Isabella, Wellsby, Solstrom, uh, she's looked at the pottery, the ceramics from all of these sites, and it's possible to date the sites then and stratify them. You can see they're not randomly distributed in the landscape. Many of these sites are associated with ancient channels of the Nile, uh, which flowed at various times during the Holocene. And that has been the focus of our investigations. When were those channels flowing? When did those channels dry out? What was the local environment like? What, what, did, what uh, resources were available for people at different societies at different times? And how quickly did the environment change? So to cut right to the chase, this was a map that we published in Geology just a few years ago, 2013, and it integrates all our geological data and all our archaeological data. So there's a huge amount of information into this rather simple map. Um, and it shows, this is 
Before the Neolithic, before 3500 BC, all these channels were flowing. This is the modern, what we call the Dongola Nile. Then there's a central Nile here we've called the Hawaii. And then there's an eastern Nile channel here called the Alfreda Nile. And downstream of this confluence is called the Salim Nile. In the Neolithic, we've got sites associated with the channels, but many sites that are not. <coughs> Big change here uh, by the time of the Kerma period, almost exclusively, all the sites in this region are associated, very closely associated with the channel. So there's a major environmental change here where the local climate became dry. We had the onset of the formation of the Sahara Desert. And then periodically then into the New Kingdom and then into the Kushite and the medieval periods, parts of this channel network dry up. And we have abrupt changes in what we call channel network contractions. So this has profound implications for the way the... Um, cultural activities are organized on this valley floor. Okay, so after this point, you have to be close to a river channel to survive, apart from the modern period when we have modern technology. So I'm particularly interested in the transition here from this state here, what, the Neolithic, if you like, to the Kerma period, or the end of the African human period to when we get the arid to Sahara. Was this transition abrupt? Was it gradational? And here, with the archeological dates, we've, we've got a gap of about 900 years here. So we need to have some independent dating uh, the geological record to try and constrain some of these changes. <coughs> so what does the landscape look like? Well, this is standing on the bedrock plateau in the east, looking westwards across the Nile Valley. This is one of these ancient channels here now that's been farmed by modern farmers using diesel pumps to get groundwater from the Nubian sandstone. The modern Nile's about 15 kilometers over there to the west in the distance. It's a fairly flat, featureless landscape, apart from the, the delicate topography of these old channels, or apart from when you, you come across um, sand dunes. So we um, started a program, myself and Mark Macklin, in 1995, such a long time ago, but it's continued at various intervals since then, uh, to get to know the local farmers, to get access to um, these little small holdings where they dig pits. They dig pits, they put an Indian diesel pump at the bottom and they extract the groundwater. And these pits give us fantastic 3D sections in the alluvium across the whole of the area. Some of them are round, some of them are square, some of them are shallow, some of them are deep, some go down to bedrock. But they give us wonderful exposure. So the fluvial archive is very, very accessible and very well preserved. And because development in the area isn't as advanced as you find in Egypt, the Pallia channels are very well preserved at the surface. So it's a wonderful place to try and integrate landscape change fluvial change with the archaeological record. So we spent a lot of time in these holes. We've looked down literally hundreds of them. Uh, we've logged many of them systematically here. Uh, all of these have been logged and sampled. The ones that are black have been dated with luminescence primarily, but also with radiocarbon. Organic material is very rare, but luminescence has been the, the real boon in this, this, this environment because it's allowed us to date the records. Uh, we've also used a variety of other techniques as well. So we've built up a record of environmental change here, fluvial environmental change. Now, if we just focus in on this part of the record here in the northeast, pits 37, 38, 40, I just want to show you what some of these records look like. So, but this is the oldest date that we have here, 8.42 Ka. This is a very deep pit here, thick Nile alluvium. So, the great big wild Nile in the early Holocene was lapping up against this bedrock plateau. All the channels were flowing at this time. The archaeology suggests that our dating of these big slabs of Nile of alluvium also uh, indicates that. So, we, we can date the sand units here, which give us good. Uh, resolution. Well, interestingly here, the modern farmers are growing crops in Neolithic alluvium, okay, which is quite a nice thought, right up against the, the bedrock plateau. Now, when we go up against the bedrock plateau here, we get these wonderful alluvial fans. Now, these are now, they're no longer active. There's a whole series of wadis which come off here. These wadis were active in the early Holocene. So, one of the ways of um, working out the local climate is dating when those wadis were active. So when the wadis were active, the local climate must have been wetter, but they haven't been active for an extended period of time. These are the, you can see the gray silts of the ancient Nile here, and these are the modern small buildings. <coughs> so they give lots of pits here that we can look down to look at the records. Now these are some of these lovely fans. These are now fossil fans, but um, in this pit here, 37, we can see floods from the wadis that came out of the bedrock plateau and then they were buried by Nile alluvium. So we've got evidence of local small rivers, which were tributaries then, bringing sediments into the Nile and then being buried by Nile alluvium. So we can date the local and the more regional environmental changes. This is Mark Macklin in the pit. These are wadi gravels here, and wadi sands, and wadi gravels, Nile alluvium sitting on top. We've got a date here of 5,000. 
which is getting towards the end of that African humid period. So when we had the Green Sahara, these wadis were flowing, they were tributaries. And that meant that you didn't have to be next to the, modern, next to the Nile channels uh, to subsist or to grow crops, because there was water available around much of the landscape. The local climate was wetter. Moving further away, uh, this is pit 23, this is in the Kerma period, we've got dates here, slap bang in the middle of the Kerma period, you get huge big slabs of Nile alluvium uh, being deposited, they're typical. Interestingly, in all of these pits throughout the whole of the regions, we see very little buried archaeology, which suggests that the locations of these channels, the sort of macro fluvial network has been fairly stable over a long period of time. The, we see archaeological sites of different periods well preserved at the modern land service. So these channels haven't been moving around. They haven't been moving around and burying the archaeology. They've been relatively fixed, which is actually um, favours um, agriculture at different periods of time. How do we date the end of these channels? How do we date a channel when it dries out? Well, this is a channel system, the Hawaiian Nile. This is 41 or 42 here. The, in the, after these dried out, uh, people dug wells in them, these brick-lined wells, and they filled up with windblown sand. If you dig into these wells and sample the sand, you can get a, 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 an estimate of the, of the age for the end of the, of the drying out of the channel. We've got some quite sensible ages here from that approach. Elsewhere, you've got beautifully preserved channels. This is a fossil channel here on the confluence between the Alfreda and the Hawaiian Nile here. You can see it on the satellite image. Lovely little channel system here with, with levees on either side, convex upwards. We dig pits in the bottom. We can look at the alluvial record. We've got windblown sands here, but we've also got evidence of floods coming down these channels after they've dried out. And we can date these. There's a date here of 1300 BC, which is an interesting date, which roughly tells us when that channel dried out. Well, the channel wasn't flowing permanently after that point. It was flowing uh, intermittently. So we have a, a very highly seasonal, but ephemeral channel uh, after that point. So that allows us to um, put brown lines on here to show when the channels have dried out. We can also identify when channels were ephemeral or when they were seasonal or when they'd completely dried out. And um, this has allowed us to identify a series of contractions. So it's not so long ago when people were arguing that the Holocene climate had been relatively stable. Now we now know there's a major climate transition here from the wet Sahara to the dry Sahara. But we've also identified a series of contractions which are related to climate change. There seem to be which have driven major falls in Nile discharge. These have happened abruptly and we see evidence for them throughout the Nile catchment. And they therefore presented rather different environmental conditions and resource opportunities on the valley floor at those times. So this, the environmental change doesn't end here. There are systematic changes in the environment during the course of the Holocene after that period. And that's crucial for understanding Sudanese and Egyptian Nile Valley archaeology. Other examples of contractions, Matt Dalton will talk about Amara West. This is Neil Spencer's site further to the north. This is what it would have looked like in 1300 BC when the Egyptians, the Egyptians evaded in 1500. They built a town here in 1300 BC at Amara West on a little island here, upstream of a big island. A generation later, there was a major contraction. Those channels had dried out. Pretty much you've got the modern Nile here. The desert came down here. You don't build your town on the west side. It was a bad choice. All the modern settlements are on this side of the valley where you're not attacked by windblown sand from Libya. So a major contraction here in the north. So this was caused by climate. Elsewhere, in the middle of our reach here, this is Arjuan Island, one of the biggest islands in the Nile Valley. We haven't worked here, but it's been surveyed archaeologically. In the Kerma period, you've got three active channels. The modern channel was active, there's a channel here to the right, and this channel 10 kilometres in the desert, which was bypassing the island here. By the medieval period, only one channel was active. So we have systematic contractions, and we see them in various locations at various scales in the desert. So these aren't just local phenomena, these are Nile Valley-wide phenomena. And in many ways, we see them in the Sudan most clearly because the evidence is best preserved. Okay, so dating is key to all of this. So for landscape archaeology, and to integrate the archaeology with the environmental record from the geomorphology, we have to have independent dating control. And I've listed all our luminescence and radiocarbon dates here. We've got about 50-odd dates now, which we've built up over a substantial period of time. I've also got interested in strontium isotopes. It's trying to characterise if there have been major changes in the behaviour of the Nile system as we see these systematic changes in, in channel behaviour. So we've got strontium isotopes and neodymium isotopes. And for all the sites where we've got dates, we've, I've been taking systematically sediment samples over the years and we finally got some money to analyse them. So I just want to show these data. So these are the Neolithic samples um, which pl plot out centron about 0.706 in terms of their strontium isotopes. 
So this is time scale on the bottom. These are all Neolithic samples. We've got one outlier, a very old one here, but most of them date between about um, sort of four and a half thousand to just over six thousand years ago. If we put the Kerma ones on, from these are from Kerma sediments. There's a systematic shift in the composition of the alluvium. The strontium isotope values fall, and they're very close here, but they don't actually overlap. So we've got a different population here. Now those flood units I showed you that are in the Pallia channels, they're laced with windblown dust. They've, plot, they've got very high strontium isotope values, they're very, very different. Now the classical way of interpreting these records of strontium isotopes in the past, if you've got more strontium isotope, higher ratios, it's more white Nile sediments, because the white Nile produces higher strontium isotope ratio laced sediments. But that isn't what's happening here. What we've got here is, is um, we've got two different directions. This shows more wadi inputs. Wadi sediments have very high strontium isotope ratios. So these are, this is a Nile that's been having lots of contributions of sediment from wadis. In the other direction, this is the dry Nile, where you've got more aeolian sand, more aeolian dust coming in. Again, they have high strontium isotope ratios. So we've got two different trajectories here. We've got a wet Nile and a dry Nile, and the Kerma period is somewhat intermediate. And also what that shows is, is this transition from one to the other. When the wadis stop flowing, and the wadis stop bringing the sediments in, this is the Green Sahara here, and this is the Desert Nile, and this transition seems to happen very abruptly around about 4.5 Ka, and that's rather later than the records elsewhere suggest, so the transition in Sudan may have been rather later. But there's a very pronounced shift here from the Neolithic Nile to the Kerman Nile in terms of the composition of the sediments in the floodplain, and that's quite uh, important for a number of reasons. So this valley floor here, we're dealing with um, Lots of wadis flowing off the bedrock plateau, bringing high strontium isotope laced sediments into the river system. And also what you need to think about is that we've got wadis throughout the whole of the desert now, throughout the whole of Egypt, not just in this reach, but upstream of here, bringing in sediments, local sediments at this time, affecting the composition of the Nile. So we've been able to calculate that during this Neolithic period, wadis were contributing about 50% of the sediment load of the Nile, which is, uh, which is uh, quite remarkable. Also what that means is, because local rainfall was higher and these small rivers were flowing, you don't need to be located near to the modern channels. But by the Kerma period, after 4.5 Ka, <laughs> immediately before this period here, um, these wadis, this input has been replaced by windblown dust, which is lacing the floodplain soils and, and those, those, those um, thin flood units in the old channels. So we've got a very different system here. The local climate becomes dry and then hyper-arid, and you have to be located next to the Nile to survive in this environment. So we, we see a major reorganisation of cultural activity on the valley floor, but that's also accompanied by major changes in the behaviour of the River Nile in terms of its discharge and in terms of the types of sediments that are coming down the river system. So this is a fluvial landscape. If you look at a satellite image of the Nile, <coughs> Egypt or Sudan, it's a fluvial landscape. There are wadis everywhere. So, Amelia Edwards wrote this wonderful book, A Thousand Miles Up the Nile, and I've given this talk before and called it A Thousand Wadis Up the Nile, but there are tens of thousands of wadis up the Nile, and they were all flowing during this Green Sahara, during the African humid period, making a major contribution to the sediment load of the Nile, but also creating a rather different environment with different opportunities for agriculture and other activities uh, on the valley floor. So, wadis, which is an Arabic word for an ephemeral river, the wadis became tributaries. Now this map uh, we published just uh, at the end of 2015. Um, I've separated out the White Nile here, the White Nile catchment, the Blue Nile, the Apra. The Blue Nile and the Apra, the Ethiopian Highland, dominate the sediment load of the Nile. They always have and they do today. But this is what I've called the Desert Nile. This is over a thousand kilometers squared. And some really big wadis here in Sudan. There's much smaller wadis and also from the Red Sea Hills, the ones that Butza mapped in the 1960s. You've got to imagine the whole of this system being active and all of those waters becoming tributaries and cumulatively you can add a huge amount of water and sediment to the Nile system at that time. So the White Nile is a red herring. The White Nile contributes hardly any sediment today, less than 3% and in the early Holocene probably even less because it was overwhelmingly dominated by the Blue Nile and by the waters further down the system. So um, finally, uh, a paper we published um, a group of us, Will Tuna, did these analyses, and Mark and I, when we were in Sudan, we thought, well, let's have a look at to what extent these contractions, we see them elsewhere in the Nile. So we wrote to everybody who'd been working in the Nile, who published dates on Nile channels. And uh, we did an, uh, 
Will Tuna did, a, did an analysis and did this cumulative probability plots. And we've got plots here of dates of na dated Nile alluvium, dated flood plains, and dated Pallia channels. And each of these big thick pink lines shows where we've got a peak in Pallia channel dates. And each of those is associated with a major channel network contraction during the Holocene. The ones that I've made at all, but this is the one associated with the Kerma period. This is the major one here associated with the onset of the New Kingdom. But there are other major abrupt changes in, uh, in discharge that we see over that record. So this is a model that's out there now to be tested with other information. But um, it, it's an important model, I think, for thinking about the, uh, the cultural records in the Nile Basin uh, as well. Finally, it's also important, there's been a lot of work in the Nile Valley now using strontium isotopes to analyze ancient human remains as a means of establishing uh, immigration, migration of people, and particularly the movement of Egyptians into Sudan. Now, what our strontium data have shown is, uh, Michelle Buzon and co. published series from Tombos, series of data. These are from skeletal material, mainly from teeth at Tombos, and this, they cover a big area. This is in northern Sudan, and uh, they overlap quite nicely with some strontium isotope data that we published in geology in 2002 here. Um, but they don't overlap with the floodplains, which is interesting. So if you were using strontium isotopes to characterize where people lived, or where they, where they farmed, and where they they ate their meals and they grazed their animals and they drank the water. You need to do that in the context of the local composition of the floodplain where those people were living. So these seem to be a uh, population that are farming sands, soils, uh, living in an environment that's laced with windblown dust. Okay. So we can't use this as a basis to establish that immigrants are coming in from Egypt because the record is much more complicated than that. You need to ground it in the local record. So. Finally, some conclusions. Northern Sudan has enormously rich cultural and fluvial archives. The cultural impacts of reedification that have been well known and which led to the formation of the Egyptian civilization, etc., and dynastic Egypt at the end of the African humid period, they did not end at 4.5 Ka. We're dealing with a volatile Nile even after that period. And that probably extends across into Saudi Arabia as well, Jeff. We see major episodes of channel network contraction. They happened abruptly and each presented very different valley floor environments for the ancient inhabitants of Nubia. And the dating control has been key here to establish the timing of those changes, as well as a huge commitment to field work, <coughs> working with archaeologists in the field to build up these records. Wadis and the Desert Nile catchment were major contributors of water and sediment during humid phases. The White Nile sediment was minimal. We've shown this from the strontium and neodymium data. So, the Fluvial Archive in the Nile Valley preserves a wonderfully rich and globally significant record of Holocene climate and hydrological change. Understanding this record and the landscape changes is clearly essential for a more complete understanding of the human past in the Nile Valley. These contractions are important and they're really important for having a better understanding of the archaeological record. Finally, um, why Sudan? Well, at the moment, um, we've worked in Sudan for the last 20 years and built up a record. Other people have worked in the Sudan. If you can't just contrast it with Egypt for the moment, which is, which is uh, an environment that people are probably more familiar with, which has more spectacular archaeology and attracts much more publicity. Uh, politically, it's much easier to work in Sudan at the moment than it is to work in Egypt. Uh, the British Museum has more active projects in Sudan at the moment. But actually, from Aswan pretty much down to the delta, most of the valley floor in Egypt is under, either underwater, under concrete, or, un, or is ag under agriculture, fairly intensive agriculture. So the preservation of the record isn't so good. Also crucially, you can't take samples out of Egypt at the present time for dating. And if you can't get dates, you can't compare the archaeological and environmental records. It's incredibly frustrating. There's some wonderful geoarchaeological work going on in Egypt, but in the absence of dating, it's always going to be limited. So preservation, access to dating, uh, and also the nature of the record. Um, Sudan is, a, is the valley, the, the Nile in Sudan is very different to Egypt. It's a, river, it's a river of islands which provide very different opportunities for resource change. And once you have those contractions, there are profound implications for what you can do on the valley floor. So there's some interesting contrast there just to leave you with, with Egypt and Sudan at the present time, politically, geomorphologically, archaeologically, to think about. Okay, I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you.